Um, well, today is a very, very important message. Uh, it's called, Are You a Christian or a Disciple? Ooh, that's got your wheels turning, doesn't it? You're like, wait a minute, what does that mean? Are you a Christian or a disciple? Well, as we go throughout this, you'll, you'll start to pick up what we mean by that. Um, I watched a video uh, years ago, and it just really like turned on some light bulbs for me. And I'm basically going to summarize what I learned in that video in a very short way. Um, but basically, if you were a Jewish uh, person growing up, and you were six years old, you started going to Jewish school. And you would study the scriptures. You would study uh, the first five books of the, the Bible, which is called the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, from the time of six until you were 10 years old. And their goal was to memorize the first five books of the Bible. So as you can imagine, as they went through that, some people fell off. You know, some people, they realized, yeah, th th this is not for you, right? Uh, and you need to just go back to your family and, and whatever your family does for a living, a farmer or a carpenter or fishing or whatever, right? Th this is not for you. Go back to your family's business and learn from them. Uh, but if you were the best of the best, you would go on, and from 10 to about 14 or 15, they would continue to study and memorize the entire Old Testament. Okay, Genesis through Malachi. Memorize. Okay, obviously you probably lost some people along the way there, and they went to the family business. And at the end of that, if you were still good enough and the best of the best, and you were still around, you would actually start to interview with Jewish rabbis and apply to become one of their followers. So this Jewish rabbi would then grill you with questions to see if you what you knew and if you had learned what you were supposed to learn. And if this rabbi, if they thought, you know, they're pretty good, they're pretty smart, you know, they got this far, but you're, you're not for, you're not going to be one of my followers, one of my disciples. They would say, go and, and continue in your family business and learn that. But if you were the best of the best, and they hired you, essentially, they would say, okay, you are one of my disciples. You can now follow me. And this, this 14, 15-year-old would literally pack up and leave their family and leave every, their synagogue and everything they knew, and they would follow this rabbi for the next several, you know, few years. And they would literally follow you around. And the saying developed um, in that day, in Jesus' time, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. And the reason that was the phrase is because you literally followed him so closely. You followed and, you know, whatever your rabbi stepped in, you know, it would, it would fly up on you and you would be covered in the dust of your rabbi, right? And, and so that, you then became that rabbi's disciple. And you were learning and you were an apprentice learning how to be like that rabbi and do what that rabbi did. So those of us who are familiar with the Bible, we know Jesus was a rabbi, right? That was one of the things they called him. They would say, rabbi, what about this? And rabbi, teach us this. Uh, another way of saying it is master, right? You, you were the master rabbi that everyone else was learning from. They, and they called Jesus that. They say, master, when do you want us to go prepare this? And when do you want us to do this, right? Um, so I, I, I saw this uh, story that I thought was pretty funny. If Jesus were a professor today. If Jesus were a professor, then Jesus took his disciples up on the mountain and gathered them around him. And he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are you who thirst for justice. Blessed are you who are persecuted. Blessed are you who suffer. And when these things begin to happen, rejoice, for your reward will be great in heaven. And Simon Peter said, do we have to write this down? And Philip said, will this be on the test? And John said, would you repeat that? And Andrew said, John the Baptist's disciples didn't have to learn this stuff. And Matthew said, huh? And Judas said, what's this got to do with real life? Then one of the Pharisees, an expert in the law, said, I don't see any of this in your syllabus. Do you have a lesson plan? Is there a summary where is the student guy? Where there'll be follow-up assignments? Thomas, who had missed the sermon, came to Jesus privately and said, Did we do anything important today? And Jesus wept. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He was a teacher. What if I told you that many of us have misunderstood what it means to be a follower of Jesus? What if I told you that there is a word that if we got a hold of what this word truly means in the Bible, it would change the way we see everything. It would change church's standards of what is success. It would change how we went about training people. It would change our individual goals as people, as Christians, as followers of Jesus. That word is disciple. Disciple. If we really got what the word disciple means, are you a Christian or are you a disciple? That's a funny question, isn't it? Like, what do you mean? Can't you be both? Well, you can be one without the other. So get this. The word Christian is in the Bible two times. Exactly two times. The word disciple or some form of it is in the Bible some 270 times. Now, if you were just looking at that and weighing it out, you know, which would you think that God was trying to emphasize to us? Disciple, disciple right? Are you a disciple? 270 times. Another thing about those two words is when the word Christian is used in the Bible, it's more of like a passive label, like, oh yeah, you're, you're a, a Christ follower, and they stick that label on you. But disciple is more active. It's more like what you are, who you are, and what you are doing, right? Much more active word versus the passive label of Christian. So what does disciple, the word disciple, mean? Well, disciple simply means apprentice. Have you ever heard that word before? Apprentice. And so what different kinds of apprentices do we have in the world? Do you know of some different kinds of apprentices? Electrical. Okay, that's good. That's one, electrical. HVAC. HVAC, yeah, HVAC. They're learning how to do heat and air. What else? Plumber. Yeah, plumber. There's welders. There's, there's all kinds of where you start off at the lowest level, you are apprenticing, right? And what is the goal of the apprentice? To learn how to do the job. Exactly, you're learning how to do the job, and you're learning how to do it fully at the highest level, right? You start off as an apprentice, and then you become a journeyman electrician or a journeyman uh, HVAC, and eventually you want to be like your master that you're learning from, the master that you've been studying under. You want to be a master electrician, right? That's the whole goal is you're learning how to be like that master that's teaching you to do what he does, right? Do what she does. That's the whole point. That's what a disciple is. You're an apprentice of Jesus learning how to be like Jesus in character, you know, in his integrity, in his values, you're learning to be like Jesus in his character, but you're also learning how to be like Jesus and do what Jesus did. Now, when I first got a hold of that, that rocked my world. When I, that concept I just presented to you, when I first, God started putting some pieces together in my mind, and when that first hit me, whoa, we're apprentices of Jesus learning to do what Jesus did. It rocked my world. It changed the way I looked at what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So if it is our goal to learn to do what Jesus did, here's the natural follow-up question. What are the things Jesus did, right? If we're learning to do what Jesus did, okay, what are those things so that I know what our goal should be, right? And so I, I, another piece that God put together, something I learned in college, is Jesus uh, did a threefold summary of ministry uh, it's, you don't have to turn there. It's Matthew 9.35. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and disease. So uh, a guy named Everett, Dr. Everett Ferguson summarized that as the threefold ministry of Jesus. He said, Jesus spent his time doing three things. Number one, evangelism. Evangelism is a Bible word that simply means going and telling people the good news of the kingdom of God, right? Today, in our day and age, it's telling people the good news that Jesus saved, right? That's evangelism, going out and telling that message. The second word that he attached to it was edification. So edification means anything that we do that builds up other Christians, right? Teaching, encouraging, anything we do that builds up other Christians, other believers, and then three is benevolence. What was he doing? He was going around helping people 
with their sicknesses and demon possessed and anyone who was in need, right? Jesus was doing benevolence. He was helping people. Now, out of those three words, evangelism, telling people the good news of the kingdom of God, edification, doing things that build up other believers, and benevolence, what order would you put those in as far as what churches do the best? Think about that. What, what one would you put as number one that, oh yeah, churches do that really well? As a whole, churches as a whole. What would you say they do the best? Anyone? Come on, somebody be brave. The Lord, the Lord, the okay, wow, I heard all three actually out there. <laughs> that surprised me. Okay, what? If, what if, so edification, teaching and encouraging and doing things that build others up. I think that's what the church does best. This is my, my evaluation. I think churches are pretty good at teaching. They're good at teaching the word and building others up and saying, hey, this is what the word of God says. All right. I would put benevolence as second, saying, you know, there are some churches that are really knocking it out of the park when it comes to benevolence. They are really helping a lot of people, although there's quite a few churches out there that may not have that as a focus either. Right. So some churches are doing a good job at helping others in need. And then I would put evangelism as dead last. And I mean dead last. Um, you know, there's been lots of polls by George Barna and Gallus. Christianity is on a severe decline. We are not doing a good job at reaching those who don't know Jesus and bringing them into the church. Okay? So this is what hit me. Wait a minute. If I, I'm talking about myself, Jeremy Harper, right? If I am trying to be a disciple of Jesus, how am I doing on those three areas? This is what God really, he really hit me with this. Like, how am I doing in those three areas? Well, I'm definitely not doing evangelism very well. I'm not reaching, I haven't reached anybody in a while, right? This is several years ago that this hit me. Um, you know, how am I doing in edification? Pretty good. And then also benevolence, trying to really be intentional about helping people in need. That hit me, that I've got to be more intentional about that in my life. And then the second question that hit me was, how am I doing at training others to do those three areas? And the answer was failing, <laughs> fail. I was not doing well in training people in these areas. And so I realized I need to get good at these things. Uh, and it's hard when you first start doing something that you've never done before, you're not that great at it, right? Like, like what's something that you uh, started learning that you were not very good at when you first started? I know I've got some things in my mind like preaching. Uh, when I first started preaching, uh, I, I was a student and I did fill-in preaching. I didn't have very much experience at all. And I preached at this one church. Uh, it was basically my dad handed me a sermon and said, here, I'll give you a sermon. Just, just preach that. And so I did. Uh, about fast forward three years later, I, was, I had my first full-time ministry and I had been preaching for about a year at that point. And this one guy shows up at our church and he had heard me way back here three years before that when I first started and then he heard me now you know three years later and he said to me his name was the boy he said Jeremy I just got to tell you you've gotten way better at preaching than that first time I heard you and I was like man really you got to say it like that you've gotten way better I hear you you're saying I was terrible <laughs> when I first started right how many, how many of you remember when Nintendo, when the Nintendo game system first came out? And, you know, I had a cord that plugged the, the, the remote into it. It wasn't a remote, it was a controller that had to be plugged in. And when adults first started playing Nintendo, Super Mario Brothers, and they would play, and Mario would jump, they'd hit the jump button, they'd go, whoop, whoop, right? They would do this with the controller. It's like, yeah, that's not doing anything. That's not helping you jump higher, but here we are, whoop. My, my son Eric, my son Eric, when I first got my first smartphone, he, he came in one day and he saw me using my smartphone and he looks at me and he just shakes his head and he's like, Dad, Dad. And I was like, What? And he's like, I had read articles of how adults would start using smartphones and they would text with one finger like you're doing right now. He's like, Dad, that's not how you text. You text with your thumbs like this. And I was like, Whatever, son. Okay, fine. But we're not that good at things when we first start. But what is the saying? Practice makes perfect, right? And some of these things may seem intimidating, but I promise you, 
the more you practice them, you will get better at them. If we truly want to be an apprentice of Jesus, we need to, we need to uh, improve these things. So Mark chapter 1, that's where we're going to hang out for the next part. Mark chapter 1. Okay, Mark, I like the Gospel of Mark because he like condenses everything. It's like he, he shortened it. It's the shortest of the Gospels, 16 chapters. You can read the whole life of Jesus in 16 chapters, right? And, and he just starts right out of the gate. There's no, there's no Mary and Joseph story. It's just, I want to tell you about Jesus, right? I want to tell you about the life of Jesus. And he's baptized right there in chapter 1. And then he starts his ministry. His baptism kicks off his ministry. Right? As soon as he's baptized, that's when he starts doing everything. So in chapter 1, verse 14 says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he told the people. He said, Repent, the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew Casting a net into the lake where they were what? Fishermen. fishermen. Wait a minute. They're fishermen. fishermen. You know what that tells us. Remember the first part of what I told you about the Jewish system of growing up? If they're fishermen, what does that mean? Did they make the cut no. through that whole series, that whole system? No. They were not the best of the best. They were the they were the not good enoughs right. that had to go back to their family and learn the, the family trade, right? Isn't it interesting? Who is Jesus going to pick as his disciples, as a Jewish rabbi? He's going to pick the not good enoughs. And these not good enoughs are going to turn the world upside down. Right? Why? Because it's not about their abilities. It's about the power of God working through them. He's going to use not good enoughs. And if he can use these not good enoughs, what does that mean about us? He can use us too. Right? He can use anybody. Come, follow me, not good enoughs. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for what? For people. At once they left their nets and followed him. I had always wondered why at once they had left their nets. Well, it makes sense now that we understand that first part, right? Uh, everyone had wanted to, it was an honor to be the follower of a Jewish rabbi. Of course they left everything. Well, a rabbi is asking us to follow him when we were rejected by these other rabbis? Yes! Like, yes, yes, we will follow. Yes. Of course they dropped everything. They left. They left their family, their fishing business, and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Oh, what are they? They're not good enough, right? Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. Yes. So what is Jesus doing? Right off the bat, he is recruiting disciples. He's recruiting apprentices. Yes. Why? Because this ministry of Jesus is not a one-man show. Amen. Right? He says, no, we're, I'm going to develop other people. I'm going to raise them up. Yes. And they're going to turn the world upside down. They're going to change the world. They're going to change the course of human history. I'm going to pour into these people. Then I'm going to leave, and they're going to change the world. And that's what he did three and a half years later. Verse 29. Let's skip to verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. And so what do we see here? We see Jesus' compassion for those who are sick and in need. He has a, a, a huge amount of compassion for people. He even heals a mother-in-law. I submit to you, if you will heal a mother-in-law, your compassion is endless. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Here come the rotten tomatoes. No. Jesus is compassionate. He cares about people. He cares about the hurting and the in need. All right. Verse 35. Verse 35. Very early in the morning. Everybody say, very early. Very early. Oh, man. It was still dark. 
That's how early it was. Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he did what? Pray. Pray. Jesus is sitting with his Father, right? His heavenly Father. He's praying. He's spending time with his Father. God, Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So he gives his mission statement. He says, I have come here to preach. Um, that's actually a, an unfortunate translation. So the word for preach here means is, is the word keruso or keruts. Keruso is the verb. The keruts is the noun, is the person. The keruts was the person, it was a herald on behalf of the king. Whenever the king would issue an edict, they sent out the herald, and the herald would go from town to town and say, what would they say? You know, hear ye, hear ye, <laughs> right? In, in King James' time, hear ye, hear ye. And they would make an announcement on behalf of the king, right? So that's what Jesus was doing. He was going out and saying, hey, everybody, I want to tell you the good news of the kingdom of God. That doesn't have to be done on Sunday at a pulpit in a church building, Amen. right? You can go out and tell people the good news of God anywhere you go. So it's kind of unfortunate that that's how the translators translated it. Um, so maybe get out of your head that it's this right now when he was when it says he was preaching. He's just going out and proclaiming. It means proclaim. He's proclaiming the good news. Okay, and he says that is why I have come. That was his mission statement to tell the good news to all the people in these different towns. By the way, I forgot to mention something earlier, that when Jesus went in and healed Peter's mother-in-law, who was with him? We have to back up. Verse 29, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Notice that as Jesus goes in to do this healing, he brings people with him, right? He's bringing them with him, why? For on-the-job training. He's, he's, gonna, he's showing them. He's going to say, now watch. Watch how I heal people. Because someday I'm going to turn this over to you. And you need to learn how to do this. Right? He's doing on-the-job training. He's purposely bringing people with him. All right. So let's, I want to give you three things real quick. Three things. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, an apprentice, and learn his ways, these are three things that I, I believe every apprentice needs to be doing. The first one is daily devotional studies, sitting with God. So that's you and God spending time together like Jesus did. Remember that? We read that. He went off early in the morning, spent time just him and the Father. You and God. Devotional time just means spending time with God in prayer and studying God's Word. That's, that's all the word devotional means. If you didn't grow up in the church world and you're not familiar with that word, devotional just means like daily study time and prayer time with God. All right, you with me? Okay, so spending time with God. There was a, a preacher on Sunday who started to read the Bible in the service without knowing that some of the kids had prankishly glued two pages of the Bible together. And so he's reading in the story of Noah, and it says, When Noah was 120 years old, he took unto himself a wife. And here he turned to the glued pages and continued, flip the page, his wife, who was 140 cubits wide, built of gopher wood, and covered with pitch inside and out. He stopped, he flips back, reads it again, reads it again, and he says, I don't ever remember reading that in the Bible before, but I accept it as evidence that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> <laughs> Daily devotional time. You never know what you're going to find when you read the Bible. Now, we can't follow Jesus around like the early disciples did, like the disciples in the first century, to listen to his words and to observe his life. But what we can do is we can read about it, can't we? Aren't you thankful that God preserved the life of Jesus in this book? His words and his ways and his teaching so that we can know what he did and what he said. And we can read this word and learn from Jesus still today, 2,000 years later. We can still learn from Jesus 
our rabbi. Uh, I had a professor who said that he would, every year, once a year, he would read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in different translations of the Bible. I thought, that's a great idea. Every year, he wanted to immerse himself in the life and the teachings of Jesus. So every year, all four Gospels, different translations, right? Um, and so we've got uh, our next steps on the back of your program. There's what we call our next steps. Uh, you can, if you decide to do any of these, you can do one of them, you can do all of them. It doesn't matter, but just you're just basically making a goal. You're saying, this week, based on what I learned, I want to do this next step. And so for daily devotional studies, I have the next step of read Matthew 5, the first five chapters this week. Right? If you say, I want to put this into practice. I want to do daily devotional time with God. I'm going to read five chapters of Matthew this week. Okay? So do daily devotional studies, which is you and God. Time with you and God. The second one is group discipleship training. If you want to be an apprentice of Jesus, get into some group discipleship training. This is one of the key ways that we disciple people here at Impact, is we do D groups, discipleship groups. And some of you, you know, we just started these a few weeks ago, and you may already be like, why are we doing this? And, and how can we do this part? And, and if you've never done them before and you get into them, you may see some things like, why are we doing this? I don't get why we do it this way in this format. And what I'm asking you right now is for you to trust me. Okay? This is a Mr. Miyagi in the Karate Kid moment. Remember when Mr. Miyagi had him doing wax on, wax off, and paint the fence? Paint the fence up, paint the fence down. And after a while, the karate kid, Daniel's son, was like, why do you have me cleaning your cars every day? This is just slave labor. Like, what, are you, what are we doing here every day? He's like, oh, you're not getting anything out of it. Okay, how about this? I'm going to punch you and do wax off. He's like, Whoa. and Daniel's son does wax off, and he blocks him, right? Another punch, wax on, blocks the punch. Paint the fence, Blocks Mr. Miyagi's kick. Paint the fence, right? He's like, oh, he was teaching me this whole time, right? Some of you are having that Mr. Miyagi moment, like, what? What is Jeremy doing with these discipleship groups? I need you to trust me. There's a reason behind everything we do in those. Every piece has a purpose. I need you to trust me, okay? So when we're doing highs and lows, why do we share our highs, what was good about our week, and our low, what was bad about our week, every week. Why do we do that? Well, because the Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. We're supposed to share each other's joys and sorrows, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Oh, man, that's great that you had that high. That's awesome. Great. That's, that's great to hear. Um, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. What wasn't good about your week? Um, what wasn't good about your week, right? Mourn with those who mourn. Um, why do we, so one of the things we haven't gotten into yet that we're going to, don't be scared. I have faith in you. We're going to actually share highs and lows with each other, and then we're going to pray for each other in pairs. I know that sounds intimidating, right? But trust me, you can do this. You can do this. And the reason we, we're doing this is because we want you to be prepared for that moment when we want you to be prepared for when you have that moment and you're at work and your coworker comes up to you or you're shopping at the store at the grocery store and that moment happens where someone starts spilling their guts and saying oh man life is so hard and life is difficult and and you can you're already in the practice you can say can i pray for you like i would love to pray for you right now can i just do that and you're able to do that. Why? Because you've been practicing that every week in D groups, right? There's a reason behind everything. Um, I, I, I was at um, a, a Christian camp about four or five years ago, and I was the family group leader, and they had me teach the lesson to the family group. They divided all the kids up into, into family groups, and I was one of the leaders with two ladies. And one lady was about my age, uh, and then another lady was a young adult. And so the three of us had this family group. So I would teach the lesson every day, and then we were supposed to close with prayer. 
And since I had done the lesson, I looked at these two ladies the first day and I said, hey, would one of you two ladies be willing to pray? By the way, we were with fifth and sixth graders, so kids, right? Um, and I said, would one of you ladies be willing to pray and just close us out the lesson? I said, I, ta I taught the lesson, can you pray? <laughs> Both of these ladies had this very shocked, like intimidated look in their eye and was like, oh no, we, we couldn't do that. And, I, and, and, and I'm not trying to judge them or talk bad about them, but it was a moment for me like, wow, these two ladies that I happen to know <laughs> grew up in the church, did not feel comfortable praying for a group of eight kids. And I thought, we have missed something in our training at the church if we haven't equipped people to give them the confidence to pray for a group of kids. We, we've got to fix that. We've got to do something, right? We've got to do something different. And then uh, D groups has a what I call a self feeding method. We teach you a method to feed yourself the Word of God, so that you're not dependent on someone else to feed you the Word of God for the rest of your life. So it's a very simple format that anyone can do. I promise you, anyone can do. It's a very simple self feeding format, and let me tell you. You will grow more than you ever grew before in your faith when you learn to be a self-feeder. And you're going to have all these aha moments. You're going to be like, wow, I never knew that was in the Bible. Whoa, this is cool. Look at what God showed me. You will have those moments because you learn to be a self-feeder. And you're going to grow by leaps and bounds. Jesus. All right. So the last one is we have daily devotion studies. We have group discipleship training. Uh, with the next step for that one is join a D group, join a discipleship group. If that's you, check that box. And then the third one, real quick, is on the job training. I mentioned this earlier. When Jesus went to do healings, who he, what did he do? He took people with him. He took James and John and said, Hey, come watch me do this. I need you to see this because I'm going to hand this over to you someday. On the job training. And this was something, again, all these pieces, I'm telling you, is things that God has shown me over the years. These were not things I learned in seminary. These are things God showed me in these pieces over time is, hey, Jeremy, who are you taking with you when you do a hospital visitation? Um, some of you have been with me on hospital visitations, right? I've taken you because I wanted you to learn. I don't want it to be a one-man show. I want to pour into others. Um, those of us who do Bible studies, who have done Bible studies with others, take somebody with you. Who can you take with you to show them how to do a Bible study with someone else, right? And so maybe you're on the leadership side and you need to intentionally think, I need to take somebody with me. Maybe you're on the other side, the apprentice side, and you're saying you're hearing this message today and you go, I want that. I want to be a disciple. I want to be an apprentice. Ask somebody to train you. Ask somebody, say, hey, would you mentor me? Would you teach me how to do these things that Jesus did? And if you ask me, I'm going to jump for joy. I'm going to do jumping jacks and be so happy that you came and asked me that because I love to mentor people. But if you're in a leadership capacity, we got to switch in our minds. Take somebody with you. Don't just go and do it yourself. Take somebody with you. Who can you train? Who can you train? All right, so... I know this was a lot. I know this was different today, right? Some of you are like, whoa, this is this, this whole disciple thing. That's like, that's like a whole nother level. And it is. It is a whole new level, right? But I believe that's exactly what Jesus is looking for, for from anyone is, hey, do you want to truly be a disciple? Not just a Christian in name only, right? Not just, oh yeah, I call myself a Christian. Okay, but do you do the things Jesus did? Are you a disciple? Does everybody get that difference now today? Not just a Christian in name only, but are you doing the things Jesus did? Are you learning? Are you apprenticing? And my prayer before I came here this morning is I was praying, God, would you open up the eyes and the heart of somebody, somebody to say, I want to be a disciple. And I, I pray that somebody is in this room saying yes to discipleship to truly be a follower and learner of Jesus. And so I'm going to pray for us.